everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Benjamin Quinn and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science and the Harvard Library, I'm honored to introduce this virtual event with Nina Krauss presenting her book of Sound Mind, How Our Brain Constructs a Meaningful Sonic World in conversation with Ani Patel. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. Coming up in the series, Thursday, January 27th at 6 p.m., we'll host celebrated physicist and science writer Leonard Mladenov in his new, for his new book, Emotional, How Feelings Shape Our Thinking. To learn more about this and our upcoming other upcoming virtual events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. I'll also be posting a link to our Science Research Public Lectures YouTube channel in the chat where you can view previous talks you might have missed. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our authors at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll shortly be posting a link to purchase of Sound Mind on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help the ensure, ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University, and thank you all for showing up and tuning in, in support of authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially for science, because it really matters. And finally, as you have no doubt experience in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. If they do, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Nina Kraus is a scientist, inventor, musician, and the Hugh Knowles Professor of Neurobiology, Communication Sciences, and Otolaryngology at Northwestern University. For more than 30 years, she has conducted groundbreaking research on the biology of auditory processing, expanding our knowledge of the brain and exploring the ways that our lives in sound shape our learning. Tonight, she is joined in conversation by Ani Patel, professor of psychology at Tufts University, where he researches the cognitive, neural, and evolutionary foundations of musicality. He is the author of Music, Language, and the Brain, the first comprehensive study of the relationship between music and language from the standpoint of cognitive neuroscience and of the lecture series, Music and the Brain from the Great Courses. This evening, Professors Krauss and Patel have joined us to discuss Nina's book of Sound Mind, a thorough and powerful examination of the partnership of sound and brain, which Marianne Wolf, director of the Center for Dyslexia, Diverse Learners and Social Justice at UCLA, calls one of the most beautiful, evocative, illuminating books ever written about how what we hear shapes who we are. In prose that has been called lively, accessible, and profound, Dr. Krauss shows how our engagement with sound leaves a fundamental imprint on who we are. The sound of our lives shape our brains for better and for worse and help us build the sonic world we live in. Without further ado, I am delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, Nina and Ani. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Well, um, I'm I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very happy to be here with with Ani Patel, um, and I, I hope we can have a good time uh, discussing through sound. And really, one of the most beautiful things about sound is that it's it's alive. It's in the moment. Uh, you know, we we don't have a script. Uh, but we have things to say and we can um, respond to each other in, in a way that really only happens with sound. So sound to me is, is just magical and, uh, and, and scientifically accessible as a biologist. And um, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, studying sound in the brain. And, and if you go to our website, um, my lab is called Brain Volts. If you go to our website, you'll see pictures of the different topics that we research, and uh, they they extend from music to concussion, rhythm, hearing loss, autism, reading, um, aging, many many different um, topics. And and you know you might even ask yourselves, well, what what are they doing at Brain Volts? Um, but it's all under the umbrella of, of sound and the brain. And my experience has shown me that um, 
this this topic, you know, if you just think of all the topics that I just mentioned, um, they are part of our lives, and people are interested in this. And and as, as I I talk to people just over dinner about you know what it is that I do, I find that 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 there's there's interest. And and oh my goodness, I'm interested. I love this. I, I am so lucky to to be doing what I do. And um, and so I thought, well, gee, I, I would write a book and try to put all in one place um, some of my perspective about sound in the brain, some of the things that that we have have learned. And, and you know, my hope is that there would be something um, that that people would get something out of the book, no matter what their background is, even if they had no background at all in sound in the brain or if they had um a, a, a very specialized background like Ani that there would be something there um for everyone who is interested in that topic and it, it turns out that that sound is so under recognized in this um visually biased world of ours these days um and and I, I think the biggest reaction that I've gotten to the book so far uh, has been I had no idea I had no idea sound was so important. I had no idea sound um, was so important in making us who we are. Um, and and you know this was in, in people who sometimes uh, you know work with sound in in their lives. Um, so and, and and I feel the same way. You know I'm I'm always astounded by by the the power of of sound in our lives. Um, so I've, I've tried to take a very informal tone in the book, and I've worked very hard to, to put things in, in plain English, um, because as scientists, we can get so goofy and jargony. Um, and, and yet, I, I, I like to think that it is scholarly in that uh, a third of the book, no, 20% of the book, 20% of the book is, is references. So I'm, you know, I'm not just saying the things that I put forth are um, ideas that scientists have have come up with, and so I, I try to, um, to 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 make this biologically accurate. Um, there are 80 illustrations, and I, I worked in partnership with Katie Shelley, who is an artist. Uh, and, and, you know, again, it was this, this back and forth of trying to figure out what I was trying to say and how we could illustrate these, these, these concepts that are often cartoon-like and whimsical um, to get the points across and, and also to make the big point to me, um, you know, I think there is so much art in science. And to be as explicit about that as possible was something that I, I wanted to do. And, and I wish you could see the illustrations in color. They're even better, but they're, they're, they're pretty good in grayscale. Um, another point about the book is that it's, um, you know, science is a deeply human endeavor. And, uh, you know, we're, I, I think we, we sometimes forget that, but I think that's a very important part of science. And so throughout the book, you know, you will hear, stories about uh you know about me and my mom and um just you know how i go through life and how discoveries and ideas about sound uh, have a meaning for me um so that was also an important part of 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 the book um and so the, the very first part of the book is how sound works and it's a story that I, I've taught. I'd love to tell it again and again and again. And it's really about signals outside the head, sound waves, and the brain that makes sense of it. I spend a lot of time talking about learning how the signals outside the head are uh, interpreted by the signals inside the head and how we, we have this, this, this communication with our world. Um, and so a lot about learning. And, and I, I talk about my uh, the quest of our lab, Brain Volts, to try to figure out how best to um, access sound processing in the brain in experimental animals and um, in, in humans so we can use this information. I really want to be able to use this information uh, for education and, and medicine and to inform us about, about human hearing. Um, 
the the second part of the book, which is the biggest part of the book, is our sonic selves, and it's uh, very simply put, our lives in sound make us us. And so I, I take in part, there's a chapter on music, there is a chapter on rhythm, um, the root of language is sound, music and language, the bilingual brain, I talk about bird song, noise, aging, athletes, the healthy brain and the impact of head injury, concussion, and then the last chapter is is a call to action is you know knowing what we know about the biology of sound and sound processing in the brain, what can we do for how we live our lives and how does this affect the choices that we make in education and in medicine for making um, the the world be as good as it as as it can be and I think that um thinking about that explicitly is very important because from the very beginning, people don't think about sound because it's invisible. And yet it's a deeply, deeply, deeply powerful force. You know, think of gravity that's invisible too. Um, it, it, it very much makes us um, who we are. And importantly, it is our way of communicating with each other. So I'm, I'm gonna stop just with this introduction and, and, and Ani give you, uh, I'm, I'm just mostly interested in, in what you have to say and, and, and going back and forth with you because sound enables this, this uh, you know, what Ian McGilchrist calls between this, this, this back and forth, right? So, right. so what do you think? Well, I have a little bit of a few notes I've made that I just want to start with. Um, but yeah, just going to start by singing your praises here for a minute, you know. Um, Nina's work has been an inspiration to me for a long time. Um, I love the way she uses highly precise neural measurements of sound processing in the brain, how she relates those to real world issues like reading difficulties, the effects of concussion on the brain, how aging affects our ability to understand speech and noise. And she examines people of many ages and also looks at how different kinds of training, including musical training, can enhance the neural processing of sound and how that influences abilities like reading and understanding speech and noise. Nina work, Nina's work has played a key role in a hypothesis I developed to help understand why and how non-linguistic training can help enhance the brain's processing of speech, the opera hypothesis. And Nina also inspires me as a person because of her big heartedness with her colleagues and her students, her scientific courage, and the way she's worked so hard to connect research on sound processing in their lab to the real world issues about learning, especially in underserved populations. So let's start by talking about that, Nina. There are very few studies that look at the impact of music training on the brain in the wild, in schools, um, especially with underserved populations. And you've done two of those studies. Um, one was in Los Angeles, the Harmony Project, which you write about in the book, and another one in the Chicago Public Schools. These lasted five years, tested over 200 participants a year. These are difficult landmark studies. And they're important uh, studies in terms of the brain and cognition because you used EEG to study the details of how the brain responds to speech sounds. And you were able to show using these longitudinal measures, which over time, that music actually causes changes in these neural signals and how those changes relate to things like reading abilities. Um, so I just want to start with a question. If, if given those studies, which are so unusual and hard to do and that you pull them off, um, if you could speak to young scientists who are maybe listening today or to funding agencies who want, might want to do this kind of work and link precise neural measurements to real world educational settings and issues, especially with underserved populations, what would you want them to know? What did you learn from doing those, uh, those, those things that are such unusual kinds of projects? Well, I, you know, one of the things that I learned was to really become a part of those local communities. And, uh, and, 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 and I love that. You know, it, we, we, we took the lab out to, to Los Angeles to the gang reduction zones of LA and, and then we were in, in Chicago um, public high schools. And we, it, it really involved the, the, the principals, the teachers, the music teachers, the teachers who taught language, you know, bilingualism. We were interested in, you know, what was the, um, the biological um, effect of 
um, of music instruction, especially in underserved kids? Um, what is the signature of, of, the, of, of poverty in, in the brain from a neural standpoint? Um, what does speaking another language, because many of our kids uh, sp speak two languages from birth, uh, Spanish and English, and you know, it turns out that there are huge advantages that come from speaking another language. But really the important thing is the connection with the, um, with the community, both in starting, we couldn't have done these studies if the founders of the music programs um, hadn't come to us. And you know, they, they came to us with a hypothesis to test. You know, mm. They said, um, you know, Nina, we, we already know that the kids who play music in school are the best students. What's going on in their brains? And uh, so, so they came to us with this this question, and um, you know, logistically, it really was very um, uh, challenging. And I, I really need to acknowledge my my all of my colleagues at, at Brain Vaults, and in, in particular Jen Crisman, uh, who is you know kind of a linchpin in both of these. Um, and, 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 um, you know, I mean, she, 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 she knew their phone numbers would call them up, you know, he's a teenager, you got to remind them of their, of their appointments, but we got yeah. involved with yeah. them, you know? Um, yeah. And you were very creative too. I mean, I think our, in your book, you mentioned how in the LA arm of this project, you were having little brain EEG setups in janitor closets in the schools, right. That you were able, that you had to run students in those little closets. I mean, that's yeah. so far from the normal lab experience that scientists are used to, um, but you made it work, right? Well, but that was a very important part. You know, as much as we love controlled experiments, especially with something like music, the more control you put on it, uh, sometimes it, 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 then you, it no longer is, is music and it is no longer music instruction. And so what was really <laughs> important, and I think this is important for, you know, you're asking for other scientists thinking about this, is thinking about um, if you want to be studying something in, um, in, in, in its natural environment. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is, you know, we didn't want to set up a music program ourselves. I mean, we didn't, wouldn't know how to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, we, we didn't want to have a, some laboratory-based program. We did this because both programs in both cities were well-established mm -hmm. music programs that were successful in teaching music mm -hmm. for years. We already right. knew that. So right. they had all they had all that infrastructure in place. And all we needed to do was come in and figure out what we wanted to measure. Right. And um and and and, and I, I think I, I want to take this this opportunity to say that uh, you know one of the, of the core themes of the book is that the hearing brain is vast, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I, I think as scientists we often think of the auditory system as as this 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 place in the brain that in fact um, very much engages uh, not only what we hear but how we engage with our other senses how we feel right. Right. what we know how we think how we move, yeah. you know, more formally, hearing engages our cognitive, sensory, motor, and reward systems. And knowing that as a biologist made, you know, me think that, well, music likely works mm -hmm. because, you know, we know that music really engages all of these aspects of the hearing brain, the sound mind, right. which is a combination of all of those things. So, um, you know, we, we, we really were interested in, in yeah. looking at it biologically. Well, why don't you remind our, our listeners or tell them briefly what you found in those two studies, because that they were important findings. And um, like I said, rare, because it really got to the issue of, you know, do people who have music training show better brain responses to speech and so sort of because they're born that way and that's why they got into music to begin with? Or is it a result of music training? And of course, there's probably innate predispositions that contribute, of course, but the question is, is there actual effective training on the brain? 
and the way it processes speech. And the only way to really get at that is with these experiments where you train people over time and you measure before and after both their brain and their language abilities. And you show that the changes are causally related to the training and not just predisposed things that were already there. Well, you know, we started out um, with two groups of as well matched kids as we could. So, you know, we, we matched them on everything that we could think of their cognitive, their reading abilities, their ages. Um, and then we followed them over time. And, uh, we, you know, one group had music and another group had another enrichment activity that wasn't music. And, um, and we followed these groups over time. And one of the major questions that we had was, could, you know, yes, we were, of course, interested in measuring attention skills and measuring rhythmic skills and measuring because rhythm is so important for language. Um, we were interested in, in cognitive skills, um, in, um, in memory, reading. Um, but there, there are so many factors that go into those kinds of behavioral tests. And as, as a biologist, you know, and at, at Brain Vaults, we really wanted to know, can we um, root this in the brain's response to sound? So, you know, a, a big measure was measuring the brain's response to complex sounds, to speech sounds, um, at various stages of the, the, the time that it took to, to do these projects. And so, you know, we did these over four and five years. And so we would measure the brain activity, you know, as anybody who's listening certainly knows as I'm talking to you now, the neurons in your brain are producing electricity, which we can capture with, uh, with sensors, with the EEG electrodes. And, um, you know, it, it turns out that, that one, of, one of the things that we've really developed over the years that you can read about in our quest chapter um, is, is about how, uh, you know, we can measure uh, how good a job the brain does at processing the different ingredients that make up sound. And one of the things that, that we discovered is that making music um, actually changed, not, not how a, a, a child responded to all aspects of sound, but to certain dimensions of sound, in particular, the harmonics in sound, which are very, very important in distinguishing consonants. Uh, different aspects of timing. Um, so there were certain ingredients in sound processing that were uh, strengthened in, in these kids. And, you know, I think another lesson that we learned, uh, which was kind of a terrifying lesson to learn as we were learning it, was in both studies, after a year, um, we didn't have any, we didn't, we couldn't see any really significant biological changes. It was, it was really after two years that um, we saw these fundamental changes in the brain, which I, I argue is what makes us who we are. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I've, I've formally, I've, I certainly talk about this in the book, but I, I put together a 400 word, um, I was inspired by you, Ani, you, like the opera hypothesis, I came up with the beams hypothesis, B-E-A-M-S. It's just 400 words, but it, it, um, um, it, it explains, uh, in, in my view, it pulls together information that we have about how our experience with sound through our efferent system um, eventually changes our default responses to sound, our afferent processing of sound. And, uh, you know, through the engagement of cognitive sensory motor and reward system, then creates our memories for sound, which, you know, I mean, what are we? We, we you know, we are our memories to a, a great extent. Um, and so these, these programs were, were, were really helpful in, in helping us come to these understandings. Tell me briefly what BEAM stands for. Yeah, so B is for brain, uh, E is for efferent. Okay. So, and e, so the efferent is, it, it takes the, uh, the, the experience, the experience through sound. Mm -hmm. um, A 
So after experience through sound, it, it, it changes how the afferent, um, so you can think of the efferent system as the brain to ear pathway, mm -hmm. and then the afferent system as the ear to brain pathway. Right, and, and one of the big things of your we book. go the other way around, but I'm saying, right. no, we got the brain and we have the ear to brain pathway, which this is really what, um, you know, our life and sound, how we engage mm -hmm. with sound changes, how we just perceive sound from the get-go mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. our afferent brain, right. ear to brain system. Right. M is memory. Mm -hmm. And S is sound, memory for sound. So. Right. So it's really about the two-way path between sound and the brain, because the traditional view is right: is that sound waves activate our our ears and our auditory system signals go up to upstairs where they're processed and cognitively and so forth. But a big theme of your book is how much information flows the other way, right, from the higher levels of the center all the way back down out to the very ends of our auditory system where we first pick up sound, and how it's really this two-way traffic, this negotiation between the outside in and the inside out, that really gives us our experience of sound. And uh, sounds like the beams hypothesis nicely puts that together. Um, okay, well, I want to just ask you about one other um, kind of landmark study that you did. Um, so you did a study of what are called uh, biomarkers. These are things you can measure um, biologically that give you some measurement of some trait or behavior or outcome that you're interested in. And in, in another landmark longitudinal study that you published, um, you show that neural measures of speech, the so brain measurements of speech sound processing and noise, and specifically how the brain responds to consonants at age three, predicted reading scores at age eight. Now, of course, auditory processing is just one factor in influencing development of reading, but you did find these correlations. And you know, there are other factors like working memory, attention, aspects of visual processing, et cetera, but nevertheless, you found this quite striking relationship between something you could measure in a three-year-old just by having them listen to these syllables and noise and their reading scores at age eight. And you have a quote from the paper that you published about that in 2015 in PLOS Biology, a beautiful paper where you wrote, early identification of children at risk for reading problems is crucial. Interventions that are provided early enough can bring struggling pre-readers in line with their peers and offset years of reading difficulties. So basically you're arguing for something like let's catch problems with reading in preschool, just as children are beginning to learn to read and not wait till second grade when they're trying to read to learn and they're struggling and they're under great distress and their parents are under great distress. And uh, I think there's a lot of uh, interest in that idea of early prediction of later reading problems so that you can intervene at a time when the brain is the most plastic and you don't wait for them to fail uh, before you start helping. Um, but can you Tell us why are biomark biomarkers important? These, these very precise neural signals we can measure from the brain and its response to sound. How do they go beyond what we could measure if we just gave kids behavioral tests of yeah. early reading abilities? And that's well, key for this whole field of neuroeducation. Yes, yes, because um, there's nothing you can do, Ani, to change the response that I will measure from your brain. You know, it really is your years of your life, you know, who you are, biologically, who you are, you know, because of, of your, your, you know, how you were born and how you have used your life and sound and these very deep things that take a year or two to, to really develop um, is, is what we would pick up if we, we play some speech, music, or musical sounds, complex sounds, and then we look at how your brain processes these different ingredients. And one of the reasons that it's it's so useful is that, um, you, you know, in a, in a three-year-old, it's very difficult to ask him, um, you know, do, do you do you remember this? Do you hear the difference between this and that? Um, you know, to, to test a three-year-old, and which in fact, our studies did involve testing three-year-olds. So we know what that's like. And then, you know, you can get a lot of, of information, but you know, psychological nothing. tests, behavioral tests. Yeah, behavioral yeah. tests. But there mm -hmm. is a lot of information that we can get just entirely by putting some electrodes on, delivering sound and measuring that brain's response to sound. And, you know, you're thinking, well, why, why would, you know, sound processing in a three-year-old tell you something about reading later on, reading ability? Well, um, you know, we, we know that 
language and, and reading is rooted in sound. And something that I think we often forget is the fact that as human beings, we have been talking for hundreds of thousands of years. And, um, and, and, and even as babies, way before a baby uh, talks, he is hearing the different sounds, he is making sounds. Uh, his life and sound is very, very rich already. Uh, his life and sound was already rich in the womb. Um, you know, out, out from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, you know, our hearing is so basic, so fundamental. Um, and, and, and it is really on this sound that then, um, you know, we, we can learn something like reading, which is really only 5,000 or so years old, um, in comparison to hundreds of thousands of years old. Um, and, and, and we can tell from how a child is already making sense of his auditory world, if he's going to have a hard time combining those sounds with the symbols of the page when later on he learns to read. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the other thing that is very much, you know, a, a cornerstone of, of, of the book is that how, um, you know, how we biologically we are what we do. So this is important at every single age. And it's important if at three or three, you know that your child um, is at risk for struggling to read. Well, this is a child you are really going to want to um, enrich with sound to meaning activities like reading, I'm sorry, like music or mm -hmm. um, like, um, you know, there are various uh, training programs for, for, for kids where they, they play around with, with sound. Um, but, you know, the more a child is engaged with making sense of sound, the better uh, he or she will be later mm -hmm. on when he needs to use the, these sonic abilities to apply it to um, not only understanding what people say, because right. again, that involves right. how we think, how we remember, how we pay attention, but yeah. also how we um, read. Right. So it's interesting. So basically, you're, you're arguing that these early brain responses, the, these brain responses you can measure in three-year-olds without them having to do any kind of task. They can even be watching a movie, right, or doing something completely unrelated to your experiment. Um, and easier to collect than say, trying to get them to do a series of structured cognitive tests, which for a three-year-old can be very challenging and maybe can totally depend on whether they're thinking about a cookie they'd rather eat than sit there. Um, that those can be predictive of later uh, reading difficulties, but at the same time, you're saying that things like so sonic training through speech-related training or even music-related training can change those brain responses in ways that then will enhance the acquisition of important abilities like reading, right? So it's both predictive, but also malleable. Um, it's not a, it's not a, uh, you know, it's, it's not a fortune cookie that says, you know, you will have problems at age eight if you have this brain signature at age three. It's saying you're at risk. Um, probabilistically, you're at risk, but there's things we can do. And if we can get in there early, we can do even better than we would if we waited for you to fail and then try to fix it, right? That's exactly the message. Yeah, right, that, that's right. why it, it's it's so important. But it, you know, and, and I think that the the fact that um, that, that that you don't need a response from a person mm -hmm. is important, not only in three year olds, but you know, when you're working with a, an older population who might be experiencing some uh, cognitive difficulties, mm -hmm. um, but especially like in young. Another population that we look at a lot are, are young athletes. You know, right. we look at our Division One athletes at yes. Northwestern yes. University, and you know, it turns out that when you get hit in the head, um, you know, that's probably not the best time to be uh, answering questions. But oh, if you right. just, you know, put a few yeah. sensors on, and, yeah. um, and 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 you know, because making sense of sound is is one of the hardest jobs neurobiologically that we ask our brain to do. It really is a measure of health. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we, we know that it can, yeah. it, it, it can 
disrupt the hearing brain. Right. I'm glad you brought up concussion because that's such an interesting line of your work. So it also uh, relates to this interesting point in your book that you bring up about noise and how we think of noise as something out there in the world, turn down the noise, but there's noise in our brains, right? There's noise, there are noisy signals in our brains and there can be a relationship between how much noise we experience in the outside world and how noisy our internal brain signals are. I'd love you to talk a bit about that because I think that's, many people don't think about that. They think of noise yeah. as something out there, not something yeah. in here. Even when it's yeah. quiet out there, there can be noise in here. Yeah, no, thank you for that, Ani, because you know, there, there are there's noise outside the head and noise inside the head. And so the, the kinds of people, groups of people in, who have excessively noisy brains well, can you just say what you mean by that, though? Yes. Maybe people so, don't so this quite is, know what um, means. If, if you are, just have um, EEG sensors and you are, you are measuring the electrical activity that is not especially synchronized, um, you're measuring electrical activity in the absence of any um, stimulation of, of any kind. So um, spontaneous it, activity. It's, it's really just spontaneous mm -hmm. activity. Mm -hmm. And and you can think of it, uh, you know, in, in terms of static, like static on the radio. It's it's mm -hmm. it's uh, it's it's often uh, it's as I say, it's unsynchronized, it's uncorrelated, um, and so it truly is noise, and it gets in the way of making sense of electrical impulses that will help you um, make sense of a signal. Mm -hmm. So think of it as as this neural spontaneous noise. Mm -hmm. which is, is, is rather high in kids who um, have experienced linguistic deprivation. Hmm. So kids whose moms don't have much education that has been tied with um, reduced verbal uh, linguistic stimulation. Mm -hmm. um, some of these kids have excessively noisy brains. Hmm. Um, in, in some people, um, a, as we age, um, our brains can become noisier. Um, and, uh, but on the other side, so, so um, you know, we, we were wondering in our athletes, so, you know, we, we have this, this, this NIH study that um, enables us to, to test all 500 division one athletes, men and women, um, whatever wow. sports that, that they're, that they're participating in. Uh, we test them at the beginning of the season and at the end of the season. And if they sustain a concussion, we test them se serially throughout, right immediately after they get the concussion for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do this, you know, this is over, this is, we're in the third year of the study. And so we thought, well, is there something about the elite athlete and, and do they process these ingredients of sound, you know, the ingredients of sound like pitch and timing, timbre, mm -hmm. um, phase, do they process these ingredients any better than we compared them to 500 Northwestern students? So they were Northwestern students, but they were not elite athletes. Okay. And we compared them. And, and what we found is that when we looked at the processing of the different sound ingredients, um, we didn't see any, any difference between the two groups. Okay. So the, the elite athletes, and the um, you know other Northwestern students all had the same strength of say harmonic encoding, fundamental frequency encoding, mm -hmm. uh, various aspects of timing. But what we found in the elite athletes is they had uncommonly quiet brains. Hmm. So you can imagine that it, I mean it results in making the signals coming in, the neural signals that respond to the outside world, it makes them stronger mm -hmm. because there's less background noise. Hmm. So, um, and, 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 and this is fascinating to me, you yeah. know, just in terms of biological mechanisms. On the one hand, you can take a bilingual that enhances certain, uh, you know, speaking another language um, will enhance certain ingredients of sound will enhance processing of certain ingredients. Mm -hmm. Being a musician mm -hmm. will will change will 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 um, uh, enhance how other sound ingredients are processed. So you have mm -hmm. kind of this enhanced sound processing 
-hmm. But then, and, and, and there's no difference in, in the musician or in the bilingual in terms of their background noise, their okay. background spontaneous activity. That's yeah. all the same. Okay. No difference there. So they make, they process sound better by enhancing the signal, whereas the, um, the athletes mm -hmm. enhance sound processing by decreasing the noise. And what does concussion do to that? Um, concussion really disrupts sound processing. And you see that in these brain signals? We really see it very, very, very clearly. Um, and, and again, you know, concussion is such, um, it is such a, 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 a tough, um, uh, problem in that, you know, no, no two concussions are the same. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, again, you talk about conducting a laboratory experiment. Well, um, you know, <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> some, 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 some athlete, you know, gets hit here. Another athlete gets hit here. Uh, another athlete just hits the ground and, yeah. and, you know, gets a, uh, you know, contra coup issue, uh, injury mm -hmm. by, by just the way yeah. his, his, um, whole, right. uh, uh, brainstem, if you will, just mm -hmm. gets, um, yeah. banged back and forth into, in, into the skull. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, so one of, uh, you know, it, it's been very challenging. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and the data are not, you know, this, this is something that, that is evolving. Like, we, you know, mm -hmm. we, it's, it's mm -hmm. not clear cut exactly um, how, um, you know, what aspects of sound processing are going to be disrupted and um, in, in, in every athlete, mm -hmm. you know, what we typically see is that there are more ingredients um that are disrupted early on and then they resolve and they tend to resolve in an orderly and systematic fashion right but you know often um you know a, a given athlete will show no particular disruption in sound processing but again having an objective measure of mm -hmm. what you want to call it of of of, of um brain health very mm -hmm. loosely um you know, for a trainer, if a trainer wants to know, is my athlete ready to return to play? Mm -hmm. Or is this um, college student, is he ready to return to learn to the classroom? Mm -hmm. If you have a, an objective biological measure that mm -hmm. can, you know, indicate, you know, it, it, he really doesn't seem to be uh, quite ready yeah. to you know, it, it, we, we know that, that it's right. so common for athletes to get a second concussion after they've had right. one. Maybe right. if they just waited a week and we could, you know, because we see these, these these responses change week to week. Mm. And, and so, you know, so wait two weeks and then yeah, it looks good. So what's neat about this is you, you it sounds like you get baseline measurements in all these people as yeah. they start yeah. their college experience. So you know what their brains, each, every, everybody's brain is different, right? And everybody's going to have a different level of background neural noise, so to speak. But you know what their pre-concussion brain looked like. So you can compare them to themselves and see, you know, has concussion changed the way their brain processes sound, which is such an not a, intuitive thing to think, oh, you know, think headaches or um, other kinds of things you don't think about sound processing with concussion typically but these measures you're applying is showing that it's having this effect which then obviously has repercussions on things like how well can you learn in the classroom right so yeah but, but you know given that we're all different yeah you know having you know an experimental design that takes the subject as his own control is, yeah. is just is is is, is wonderful yeah. Um, yeah, you know, because as you right. say, you could start yes. out with two athletes that are right. very different just at the beginning. Yeah, and the technology you're using to measure this is EEG, right? It's yes. it's electrodes, uh, not just on a cap on the skull. There's it's like a it's just measuring signals that are there. You're not injecting any electricity, um, and it's it's much less expensive than uh, MRI, right? The kind of fancy functional brain imaging that is uh, tends to get most of the media excitement and attention. Um, and so in terms of portability and um, affordability, it seems like uh, it has some advantages, right? You can do it in a closet in a school in L.A. 
at janitor's closet in a school in LA. Uh, I don't think too many MRI teams are going to be putting their machines in janitor well, closets. But I think in one of the other issues about MRI is that unless you've got a cerebral bleed or something really catastrophic has happened um, after a concussion, an athletic induced concussion, it, it you know at least in talking to my um, my, my colleagues who are physicians and trainers, they, mm -hmm. they say that, that the concussion doesn't, the effects of the concussion don't show up on, oh. on, 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 on MRI. Um, okay. So you, you really you know, need, you know, for, for, for most concussions, you need something that is, you know, really um, uh, perhaps more subtle, more um, right. precise in terms of, of being able to look at, um, at injury. Right. Right. Okay. Um, well, I think we're almost ready to start into the audience questions. So, um, I just want to end my part by thanking you, Nina, for writing this book and for making your work and your journey through the world of sound and the science of sound so accessible. Um, I think it's an inspiring story and, uh, I thoroughly enjoy this book and I, Highly recommend it to everyone who's here and beyond. Hi, so I'm here with some audience questions. Um, so many good ones. I'm going to jump into this one from Julian Johnson in the audience, um, who just asks, sound is a preferred information stream for the auditory system. However, how does sound interact with other aspects of our biology, e.g. proprioception, various visual cues, that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, I think one of the best ways that we can understand it, well, we can understand it from a number of, of, of standpoints, but um, from an evolutionary perspective, you know, sound is, it, 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 it is evolving from our very basic senses of, you know, some of the first senses were uh, animals needed to, to, to be balanced and to be upright. And then they needed to move, you know, did you ever wonder why your, your cochlea and your balance system are, you know, they're, they're, they're next door. Um, and, and, you know, we have uh, vertebrates, for example, who are blind, but never deaf. Um, and, and so, you know, hearing, which, um, you know, evolved from, you know, the, the, the cochlea evolved from ectoderm, which is, uh, you know, like our skin, you know, we got hairs here. Uh, so that, that, that has to do with touch, right? So, you know, touch and movement um, is very, very, very much a part of hearing. And so from a deep evolutionary standpoint and from an experiential standpoint, you know, we know that um, um, animals and individual neurons will respond to sound in different ways, for example, um, based on, on the hormones of, of the animal, like say if, if uh, uh, an, an animal has just given birth, there are going to be certain hormones that are going to be present. And so then the response to that pup call are going to be different. Um, and sound processing is affected by um, also not only how we move, but what we see and what we feel. Uh, so it, it really does very inherently, and that, that really is a, a deep, deep, Julian, thank you for, for that question, because um, it's a, it's a, it, I really tried to bring in as much experimental evidence, you know, from a neurobiological standpoint that really shows, um, or at least it, it, it convinces me that when we respond to sound, it, sound it, it's a very holistic experience biologically with respect to our other senses. Wonderful, thank you. So we have a lot of questions. We're not gonna be able to get to all of them. I'm gonna do my best to kind of condense the ones that are similar. So we're getting a lot of questions about noise, um, the inside, interior noise that you were talking about as well as the exterior. So. Um, Mike in the audience asks, what comprises the noise you speak of? If I'm daydreaming, is that noise? There's no outside simulation. So is the absence of noise in athletes the ability to tune out anything other than the current task? Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I cannot answer that uh, truthfully. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I just know that um, we, 
um, have a certain amount of, of background noise always electrically in our in our brains and it's just something that we are able to measure um, and the extent to which I mean there's so many one of the things I hope really comes through in my book is is that for most of the questions that people ask um, there uh, we, we don't we don't have answers uh, this is for you know scientists to uh, to continue to to, to look at so for example to you know to what extent um, is this background EEG the spontaneous activity to what extent is it um, affected for example by what an athlete you, know, you take an athlete who has I mean that what a beautiful model right you have this great model of a quiet brain you know what what is it that makes a, the brain of an athlete um, um, become noisy you know, you, you, you might try to perturb it in, in, in some way in term, like, like you're, you're suggesting in terms of what, what you're thinking about. Um, so, you know, I, I, I really, I don't know. Um, and the other thing that I want to make sure that I, I, I also say is that, um, you know, and this is the beauty of, sci of science, I think, you know, my, my students are always wanting to know the answer and hardly ever is the response binary. It's almost always, it depends. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I think that, that that's just, again, I'm, I'm just riff, riffing off the fact that I can't answer that question. And, um, um, and, and maybe somebody can. But there's so many questions that I know I cannot answer, and I'm so happy about that. I'll just jump in and say that mind wandering is, is definitely different from what you're talking about, you know, with neural noise. Like mind wandering is a, it engages its own kind of network in the brain, and um, it's very structured. The activity that uh, happens when you mind wander um, engages a specific brain network, and that's I think what you're talking about is, you know, this the, the brain is not just a certain when you're not hearing anything, it's not like it's silent in there. Uh, there's constant, lots of spontaneous activity. And you're talking about kind of the, that level of activity that exists and then how the signals that we perceive modulate that activity and how strongly they stand out from that activity. So it, it's, it's definitely not the same as mind wandering. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you both. Um, we'll move on to the next sort of <laughs> cohort of questions about noise um lots of people are questioning about the just what it's your experience of, of interacting with people who have maybe um had to deal with a lot of noise pollution we have a question from laura zanini who could you comment on noise pollution in cities living near trains for example um what what that looks like in the brain thank you thank you for that um so yeah there's a whole chapter on noise and and uh, and i i just um uh, wrote a, a couple of, of, of op-eds that maybe, I don't know if you post them afterwards on, on noise. One was in Wall Street Journal and the other was in LA Times. Um, because it, I think when we think about noise, uh, noise in the world, um, people, we all know that loud sounds are harmful to the ear. But what I am talking about are moderate level sounds that aren't uh, excessively loud to, um, you know, to, to necessarily cause hearing loss, um, but they will affect our ability to think, to pay attention, to, um, to concentrate, to, um, to remember. Um, it, you know, I, th I think many of us feel very stressed at times you know why why is that I, I try to make the argument that the, the background noise and this isn't the loud loud noise this is the background noise that is just a part of our society uh, has a huge effect on our biological health on on how our psychological health and there have been some beautiful studies showing about uh, how how kids ability to learn is uh, affected by how much noise there is in a classroom um, that, 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 that they're listening to. Um, but and, and I, I would 
ask that, um, that, that, that we all give some thought to, um, you know, ask our que the question, is it necessary? I think that, that there are many sounds that really are necessary. You know, if you, if you go to a, an, an airport, um, you know, airports are noisy places, engines are going to be noisy, conveyor belts are noisy, you know, but do we really need every time a boarding pass is scanned? Do we, does, do we need to hear two gates away, beep, beep? <laughs> do, we, do we need to hear uh, everybody's cell phone when, when they're getting a message? I mean, they're on their phone all the time, they might as well turn, you can turn that off. Um, you know, like when you're looking for your car, do, you know, do I have to wake up my neighbor when I'm locking up my car and I come home late at night? And there's so many little things like that. But again, that we don't realize, like we don't realize, I mean, we've all had the experience of, of you know, we can tune out noise very well. But then if the, the, the truck that's outside stops idling or our air conditioner turns off, often our reaction is, so we didn't even know that you know, we, we hadn't paid attention to this noise. It wasn't, you know, part of our conscious awareness, yet it made us tense because we felt relieved when it went away. So I, I really think that um, this is, again, a, a, um, an area that as a society, we really need to think about. Um, uh, Gordon Hempton wrote a book, One Square Inch of Silence, saying that, that there's, you know, that there are very few places in the world where you can actually be without man-made noise for more than 15 minutes, um, because there are, there are always airplanes that are flying overhead. Um, and so, you know, and, and again, you know, if we, 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 we think we, we're so visually oriented, we think about, um, you know, we go to a beautiful place, you're in the mountains and, you know, an entrepreneurial person might think, oh, this is so beautiful, helicopter rides. You know, think about, the, you know, what that does to the experience of appreciating the nature and think about the havoc that it creates with all of the animals that need to communicate with each other, to mate, to, 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 to be healthy. Um, so, you know, something that I, I also I touch on in the book is, is how living things, you know, any plumber will tell you that tree roots will go towards uh, water and it, they actually respond to the sound of, of the water. Uh, so they'll, 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 you know, they'll gum up your pipes. Um, so sound is, is a part of life in a way that is really under recognized and, you know, noise is, is something that we, we can, we can do a better job at, I think. Wonderful. Well, I think that's the perfect place to end and we are out of time at this point. Um, Thank you once again, both of you, for this fantastic conversation. Thanks to all of you out there for spending part of your evening with us. Please learn more about this fascinating book and purchase of Sound Mind at harvard.com. I put the link in the chat a couple times. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good night. Keep reading and be well. Thank you both for this wonderful discussion. Thank you. Well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for, for the sound that connects us. Of course. Thanks, Nina. Good to see you. Have a good night, everyone. Bye.